Hi. Um, I want to congratulate Munzer and all the folks that, uh, who set up IDSS, ASU. Uh, I think it's a great uh, initiative. And you know, I'm sure it'll make MIT great again. But, uh, but, but, I, but more importantly, I think it will, um, it's, it's exactly what we need to do now. That's what I think of it. So, Can everybody hear me well? Yeah. OK, so um, I'm a professor of ECS, uh, e ENC at separate departments at Stanford. And I'm directing this uh, Stanford Center for Societal Networks. Uh, but my research area used to be computer networks, which is all I did for about 15 years. This is internet algorithms, data centers, and cloud computing, uh, until I had a um, transformative experience by being uh, one of the people in this uh, traffic. This is not a traffic jam, it's just traffic. Okay, this is, if it appears to be jammed, it's, it's not. Uh, and so this is Bangalore, December 2007. Uh, and fancifully, I think, that's me. Uh, and at this point, you know, from looking at congestion on the internet, uh, it was natural to sort of ask, you know, after going overcoming the frustration, what can be done about congestion, okay? Uh, road congestion in particular. So that's not just Bangalore. Uh, different parts of the world uh, and different modes uh, are all subject to intense uh, uh, congestion. Uh, when, when, tra when transportation uh, networks are successful, they're usually congested. Uh, when they're not adopted, for example, public transit in the US is not very widely adopted, uh, then they usually are in loss. Okay, so it's like it, there's no nothing just right. There's no just right, it seems. Uh, maybe in Switzerland or something, there may be a just right somewhere. Okay, but, but certainly uh, not anywhere else. Um, so this is, you know, not just frustration and in indignity uh, of being like pushed into trains or jostling around, uh, but this is the cost of congestion measured in wasted time and fuel um, annually by the Texas Transportation Institute. And we, if you think of making a 10 to 15 percent dent in that sort of number, it, it, it already is becoming interesting. Uh, but of course, there are other uh, negative externalities like emissions. And the uh, other big thing that's uh, safety, uh, you know, not just accidents and fatalities, but even just in the normal operations of transit systems, you can have crowds gathering, like in the London Underground, for example, it's an open to the platform, uh, same in Delhi or, or Beijing. And when people come in, and the, the, the crowds just push all the way in, and there's the only way people can leave there is through a train, or they'll fall on the tracks. So this is sort of just an important thing to just worry about as the system is operating. Okay. Uh, obviously, the problem is very easy to state. Demand vastly exceeds supply. Uh, you've got to do something. You've got to bring the left-hand side lower and the right-hand side higher. That's just you know mathematically what we need to do. So our work actually tries to do this in two ways. One is you know when we pay people money to make off-peak trips or change their mode of travel. Uh, rather than uh, penalize them with congestion charges, for example. Uh, this is not intended to replace congestion charging. It could work in uh, concert. But um, congestion charging is not exactly easy to deploy at the level of policy. Uh, Bloomberg uh, famously failed to be able to get the vote in 2008 to, uh, you know, uh, in Albany, in fact, to get congestion charging instituted in New York City. Okay? So it's not an easy way to get elected or stay elected. But if you paid money, maybe that's not bad. Okay, but the question is, when you're paying the business, is paying money, how much money, and you know, what shift can it actually get, and does it pay for itself? Well, that's the key question. Um, and increasing supply, uh, I think Steve Coonan mentioned a few points on how data can look at uh, uh, the slack in the system. I think Munzer mentioned that, that phrase. Uh, that really is what one can do. Uh, if you think of all the work we've done in computer networks to do incredibly fine-grained understanding of network behavior, uh, nothing like that exists in the world of transportation networks. So if you are uh, an EECS type person looking to do something really interesting uh, where it's uh, fertile ground, not very trodden, think of traffic. Okay. Um, so what we've done is to design nudge engines, and we've deployed them. These things start as pilots. So you take a bunch of commuters. For example, Infosys Technologies in 2008 was the first 
uh, site of our pilot. In fact, I was driving to Infosys in 2007, December, when this happened, and I complained about it in the way that people do. I said, does anybody care about traffic? And then they said, why don't you do something about it? So one thing led to another, and then uh, you know, here we are, right? And Singapore Public Transit, it's been going on for five years. I'll highlight uh, what, what data has told us there. Uh, at Stanford Commuters and the Bay Area Rapid Transit just on, uh, early this month launched uh, the incentive program for their commuters. And also you could use the same sort of ideas to nudge people in areas like wellness. And that was a project with Accenture. So let me tell you how the Singapore MRT system works. Uh, it's, think of it as the frequent flyer mile program equivalent for public transit commuters. Um, when you're doing these nudge engines uh, for cities, you can't afford to be very uh, nuanced and, and sophisticated in the way you send your messages. It has something very easy to understand that people can just latch on to uh, straightforwardly because you're not going to meet your subjects. It's all done through some website or, or an app. So what we did was we said, think of an airline miles program. You're a smart uh, a card, uh, you know, equipped commuter. You tap into a train station uh, in some subway system. You travel. That amounts to some number of kilometers. And every kilometer you make uh, in the system, every kilometer you travel in the system, you get a point. And if you, a trip is in the off-peak time, you get three or more points. Okay, it's very simple to understand. An off-peak is not five in the morning, it's just before the peak. So it's peak, the shoulders off of the morning peak hour. So we deployed this, and you can think of an airline miles program, like United Airlines or something. So you, you travel, you, you have miles history, you go to your United Airlines portal, and you're reading these miles. Okay? So here, uh, the method of redemption is really what's key, uh, how much money is there to give, and how do we uh, uh, you know, think of adverse selection, namely all the people already traveling off-peak are the first ones to sign on in these programs, for example. Right? And how do you leave enough money to nudge uh, people off of the peak? Right? So we paid through a system of lotteries and used a game. In Bangalore, we ran a lottery uh, every week, but now that became difficult because some people want to opt out of the weekly lotteries and so on. So we just designed a game of chance. A game of chance is a self-administered lottery. You take your points and you go roll or die, and then sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. Okay? Everybody understands this. And then we also observed that social influence is huge. So if you have your friends on the program, which you're allowed to invite through Facebook and other things, we have Facebook Connects, and uh, we've used those tools. Uh, your behavior is nudging, but also you're getting as recruits, okay? marketing. Uh, finally, personalized recommendations. This is sort of, if I understand that you know, Munzer doesn't like to go off peak on Tuesday mornings and Thursday mornings, I'm not going to bother him on those days with extra you know, offers. I might do it on the days that I think he's more susceptible to, uh, or prone to taking a, an off-peak trip. Okay? So that's the idea. Here are the results, uh, one slide summary. The top left thing is the total shift before and after. So you can see <clears throat> around 8 a.m., just after 8 a.m., there's a, the blue curve has a peak. That is the peak time for trips in Singapore's metro. Uh, there's a paper on my website with more details in case you want to look at it. And we incentivize them to avoid the green zone. Right? So don't go in the green zone. Just if you take the orange on the left or the right, uh, your trip starts there, then you get three times more points. And this includes every commuter. So in particular, it includes um, those who are already making peak trips, off-peak trips, I mean. Okay? But you can see people just sh you know, shifting out to the left of the peak. But you also see this bump here. These are guys who are traveling you know, before 6.30, and they decided to go a little bit later to get the 3x hit. Okay? That's OK with us. Maybe we can't avoid it, but it's OK. Uh, the second chart on the right, or top, uh, is that it's um, focused more on the peak time commuters. You know, just the, the PDF just focuses on the peak time commuters. This is all the people who at least travel five times in the peak hour in the three months before they uh, were in the program. So obviously, these are the ones that have more to shift and so you can see a better shift. Uh, bottom uh, left is uh, even, so top, top right is mild peak time travelers. Uh, bottom left is uh, medium, and then bottom right is heavy peak time travelers. And you can see the more peak uh, their times of travel were, the more there is for them to shift. Now you can break this down into all sorts of other things. Uh, the top uh, row is what I showed you just now. Uh, those with friends in the program tend to perform much better than those who don't have friends in the program. 
people who use the random redemption scheme, the lottery-like mechanism shifted better. It's mostly to do with engagement. And those who went for the fixed exchange rate didn't do as well. And you can do, there's lots and lots of other things, okay? Um, so that's sort of the nudge engines. Let me tell you a little bit about data. So all the things that move in a city, there are many things actually. Uh, you know, the remarkably large number of signals that one can get. Uh, GPS, smart travel card from the tap in, tap out data um, for, systems, for buses and trains. Uh, cellular uh, and food. Food is something that is interesting to track. The barcodes are scanned and it's very critical for cities like New York, uh, Hong Kong and Singapore where most of the food consumed comes from elsewhere. Right, so it's worth tracking to have early warnings on contaminated food and just recalls and stuff. So we put all this together, uh, you think you might have an interesting you know, uh, dashboard but, there's lot, but the problem, there are many problems. You know, uh, it's error prone or noisy. So it's just welcome to the world of analog, okay? uh, where the information is not digital by birth. Okay? Um, and it only gives you snapshot views. I can see you getting into the station. I, I see you getting out. I don't know how you traveled, which train you were in, et cetera. Um, and they're siloed. Those who run buses are not the same folks are, those are, uh, as those who run trains. Uh, they're just different organizations, different database technologies and formats. So what's needed is a system and algorithms for solving a massive jigsaw puzzle. This is actually what we built, and uh, some of the students and I went in, uh, along, along with some ex-Googlers did the startup Urban Engines, which is where the system got fully developed and deployed. So here's an example of what I mean. You're able to observe a large system at its edge. Uh, can you reconstruct in fine detail the inside? Okay, like exactly where are the trains? In each train, how many people are there? Where are the students traveling? Things like that, okay? So that's sort of the thing that one can do. Um, and we've done it. We've also taken the New York City taxi data, pushed it through our big data system, which has a routing engine and stuff, so you can do inferences on what people are doing. So let me tell you some of that stuff. Um, in the case of the public transit or other, any, any system for that matter, you can do operations, planning, and forensics. Uh, where are, in, in real time, where are the hotspots, right? And I want alerts and anomalies. And uh, planning, should I buy double-decker buses? How many should I buy? Should I increase the capacity of that you know, highway from four lanes to five lanes, et cetera, okay? So the sort of uh, counterfactual type questions can be asked. Uh, forensics, uh, what happened? I mean, there's a train breakdown, how many people were you know, uh, inconvenienced and how did they find their way to the destination? These sort of things are useful to know. So the next time something like this happens, you have something, uh, you, you have a plan in place. So let me tell you two things about New York City cab data, which we found interesting. Uh, there are many things as part of my student, uh, Cheng Wang Zhu's PhD thesis. <coughs> but this, uh, Steve observed that this is periodic. Pickups from Midtown Manhattan, you can get it down to zip codes, zip code level data, okay? So every column is a day of the week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, et cetera, and Sunday uh, at the very end. Uh, as you can see, uh, it's highly periodic. It's slightly different on different days, but every day it's pretty periodic. Okay? In fact, so periodic that uh, I request Cheng Wang to just look at the Fourier transform of this and set it to music. Okay? So you can actually hear the sound of Midtown Manhattan and say, that doesn't sound right, okay? for example. Okay? So uh, what, what happened on those days, of course, Memorial Day weekend. Uh, financial district, different signature, but typical of, for the financial district. Okay, so it's, it's location dependent. Uh, Brooklyn, okay, so you get the idea. And it's not just for pickups, it's pickups, drop-offs, distance travel. It's not a mystery why this is all happening. It's all of us doing the same thing, like going to work every day and then going to the gym or picking up kids or whatever it is we are doing, right? So there's a very periodic rhythm to our daily lives. Um, so uh, the users are obvious. You can do better, you know, deployment uh, of the, you know, uh, system. Uh, for, I mean, the, the taxi system, et cetera, okay? So it's obvious, I'll, I'll just skip over the implications. Here's another fun thing. Uh, we looked at New York City Knicks fans. Do they tip more when their team wins and they're going back home or they, or they under the tip less other times, okay? Let's see what we found out, okay? Um, we took four games, two in which Knicks lost, two in which they uh, won. And uh, when the Knicks won, there was about a 5%, so this 19% is the actual uh, tip as a, you know, on average as a function of the fare. Um, 
with the next one, they tipped 5% uh, more, meaning it's 5% because it's 1 on 19, OK? And this is statistically significant. Now you're wondering, like, this is really, you know, not, I'm not persuaded. Many are thinking, I can hear you, OK? So let me address that, OK? Something more interesting that happens here. So it turns out, if you've taken a taxi in New York City, you have to choose the tip amount. It's always left at 20% by default. That's why it's that number, OK? So you see a mode uh, at this point, which is 20%. When the Knicks win, fans are going back. So you choose Madison Square Garden, see the destinations uh, for trips starting from Madison Square Garden. That's how this big data system works. You have to choose 25% or 30% deliberately. Right? So you can see that this person has chosen to give more tips. Right? So that's what these two bumps are. Okay? So, but then there's a small bump here. Okay, so we think that that's the fans on the opposite side, you know, <laughs> the, the other guys. They're also rejoicing. So let me leave with that, but you can sort of see how this works. Uh, there's, you know, quite a few interesting things one can say. Thank you.